Hello, Honors 201. It's me. I'm here to talk. Uh, I hope everybody's doing okay. Um, obviously, we're all sort of uh, quarantined in our homes, and uh, uh, I don't know. I hope that's going all right for you. Uh, mostly going okay for me. Uh, oh, my God, though, I've got something to tell you. This is good. You'll like this. Yesterday morning, I'm sleeping in bed, and I hear feel something on my neck and I jump up and I go like this and I oh and I go in and my wife's up and I say oh my god honey what what happened I feel like something bit me she looks at my neck and there's two big marks and it was a wasp people we found a wasp in the bed that bit me twice or bit me stung me twice before I could wake uh, up and uh, kill it uh, so uh, that's a nice way to be woken up um, I hope y'all have not been woken up like that uh, recently. Um, today, uh, I'm going to talk about Socrates, the Apology of Socrates by Plato. Um, there's a ton of stuff to talk about, people, as always. Um, I won't be able to touch on all of it. Um, I just want to bring up some of the, the big ideas that I think of when um, I think of the Apology. Um couple of things um, worth noting. Um, one, uh, Plato wrote this uh, with what, from the perspective of Socrates. So he's putting words in Socrates' mouth. Now, apparently he was there um, and witnessed the whole thing. Having said that, uh, I'm just thinking for myself, uh, if I witnessed uh, somebody talking uh, four, five, ten pages worth of writing, um, I don't believe I would be able to, to uh, uh, rewrite that verbatim. Uh, so sometimes it is very hard for us to tell what philosophy is Socrates and what is just Plato. Um, Plato was obviously a student of Socrates and appreciated him and cared about his stuff, but no doubt Plato had his own ideas as well. And so uh, Socrates um, is all interpreted through Plato for us. Um, and so again, it can be hard to tell, um, to distinguish between the two of them. So in that sense, maybe we won't really, um, because we're going to assume that they share um, similar beliefs here. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of stuff uh, uh, to talk about here. Um, I wrote down, obviously, I wrote down some questions. Um, there are things that I want to point out. Um, one, I want to point out the apology of Socrates. Um, here, the word apology means defense. Um, and so uh, this is his defense as he's being tried. Um, and so what? Um, I guess uh, obviously he's found guilty. Um, uh, he doesn't really defend himself. He, he, he um, offers some explanation, etc. But he doesn't really try to um, um, tell people that uh, uh, they're wrong. Well, I guess, no, he tells them that they're wrong. Um, he just doesn't do any ass kissing for the sake of trying to get out of it. All right? So, um, uh, doesn't back down, okay? Um, and so, um, again, is eventually uh, found guilty, um, has the option um, perhaps of being exiled, chooses not to be exiled, chooses to be put to death instead, um, chooses to be put to death. Um, he did not have to be put to death. Um, he chose that. Um, Sorry, people, just want to make a note here. Um, he chose that. Um, and so, first of all, um, uh, let's talk um, a few uh, about some of the um, ideas that he raises um, that I think are worth um, sort of discussing. Um, obviously, again, there's tons of stuff in here worth discussing. Um, one I want to point out at the beginning when he um, begins his speech, he says, listen, um, I'm not going to talk like a lawyer. I'm going to talk like how I've always talked. Um, and you have to be careful because when people are super duper eloquent, um, they oftentimes might be deceptive. And that's what he's being accused of too, is that, oh my God, he's actually a, a, a good speaker um, who is misleading people. Um, and I think by uh, at least Plato's account, he obviously is a very good speaker. Um, 
And so one of the things, though, that I wonder is to what degree do we think of um, exceptionally eloquent people as deceptive? Um, and, and likewise, to what degree do we think of uh, quote unquote sort of simple uh, uh, people or people with uh, uh, simple language as telling the truth? Um, and again, so, so I want to point out, like, so in our society, for instance, pe the people who are, are sort of most eloquent, um, to some degree or another are lawyers. Um, they have been changed, trained in that. And of course, we're also, um, all sort of led to believe that lawyers are deceptive and, um, uh, to some degree or another can't be trusted in our society. Uh, so this is an interesting thing, but, but meanwhile, let's just say, uh, you go, uh, talk to some philosophy professor and he's like, blah, 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 blah. And he talks all beautifully and he says, oh, blah, 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 blah. And then, um, um, and someone says, ah, I don't know about that. And then you go out and you talk to a, a, a ditch digger and you say, uh, what's the meaning of life? And he says, happiness. And, 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 and someone, so, so, right. So we, we have the, the, um, really smart, eloquent response. We have the, the sort of um, um, homespun wisdom. Uh, oftentimes, I feel like people in our society are more inclined to go with the homespun wisdom, no matter how good the uh, eloquent talk might have been. Um, uh, I guess we see this um, um, maybe all the time. Uh, oh, like even even now during the the coronavirus, um, we've we've got scientists, etc., telling us that this is uh, uh, important, and they're using all sorts of uh, medical language and data and um, stuff about how viruses work and blah blah blah. Meanwhile, on the other side, you got some people who say, uh, mm, uh, "Well, it's not going to stop me from living my life." And a lot of people think that sounds like really good wisdom, like it's not going to stop me from living my life. Um, and so, again, maybe we see frequently that people who are exceptionally eloquent, sometimes they are discounted for their eloquence. And likewise, people who are not very eloquent sometimes get credit for being so um, blunt, etc. Um, so I don't know, something worth um, thinking about. Uh, uh, along those lines of eloquence um, being perhaps evidence of deception. Um, another thing that uh, Socrates talks about is how the fact that he's hated by uh, people is somehow proof that what he's saying is true. Um, this is another thing that I think we see in society frequently. Um, something along the lines of, oh, if I pissed you off, it's because I've hit a, a sore spot because I'm speaking some kind of truth and that is why you're upset. Um, this is, uh, uh, again, um, an interesting idea. Um, obviously, I suppose sometimes people do speak the truth and it does make people mad. And so sometimes the truth does provoke hatred. Um, but I guess I'm more interested in the idea that people seem to think that if hatred is provoked, it must have been true. Um, so like, for instance, um, I want to say uh, the divide in this uh, uh, country, uh, let's say that we see um, between conservatives and liberals. Um, <clears throat> So, for instance, a lot of people say, oh, people just hate President Trump because he speaks the truth, and that's so blunt, and people don't like it, and therefore they get mad about it because he's speaking the truth. Um, and there's a lot of people who believe that, who believe uh, political correctness um, is a bad idea, that they like the idea that he sort of says exactly what's on his mind, and if that pisses people off, that's all the more proof for them that what he's saying is correct. Um, this is, again, just an interesting idea. If you've pissed someone off, is that because you've told the truth? Um, I would think that, uh, obviously, uh, people who are supporters of Trump would say um, um, that the reason why people are mad is because he's spoken the truth. Of course, people on the other end of the perspective would say, oh, no, we're not mad because he spoke the truth. We're mad because he spoke a lie. Um, so that maybe gets us into uh, uh, the more... Um, um, uh, uh, complicated idea of what is the difference between the truth and a lie. Hmm, maybe that's just perspective. From one side, it's the truth. From the other side, it's a lie. Hmm, I don't know. Uh, so uh, think about that, right? Um, if people get upset at what you said, is that proof that what you said is true? Um, I want to say sometimes, like, for instance, 
Well, uh, we won't get into that. Okay, um, so you just think about that, right? Um, going along with that, um, well, how about this? Um, he talks about the unexamined life being not worth living. Um, and this is obviously one of Socrates' most famous quotes or ideas. Um, and this leads to the Socratic method, what we call the Socratic method, which is this is how Socrates did stuff. He asked questions. He would say, what is virtue? And someone would say, virtue is blah, blah, blah. And he would say, well, what is blah, blah, blah? And they would say, well, blah, blah, blah is blah, blah, blah. And he would say, yeah, but what is blah, 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 right? And the point is, is that he continually asked questions. It's not a matter of making statements. It's a matter of revealing to people that when you keep asking questions, much of their thoughts, much of their ideas sort of fall apart under that kind of examination. Um, and so uh, this is the basis of, of, of uh, all of Socrates' ideas, right, is that he knows nothing and so that he keeps asking questions and that knowing he knows nothing is what makes him so wise and that he asks questions repeatedly. Um, and this, and as he says, this can really piss some people off. Um, I just want to point out that, right, basically college, uh, certainly this class, is uh, the Socratic method in action. That is what we do. We read something and we say, ah, um, they say this is virtuous. Well, what makes something virtuous? And we talk about that and we ask questions about that. Um, I would just like to point out for myself that one of the things that I've realized in life uh, as I've gotten older is just the value of questions. You know, like a, like small talk. When you're talking to somebody, you don't know what to say. Ask them questions and take care of the whole problem, right? Um, ask questions. Oh, yeah, what do you do for a living? You're a salesman? Well, what do you sell? Well, do you enjoy that? Why do you enjoy that? If you keep asking questions of people, for one thing, people like to give answers. Um, and for two, it can be incredibly revealing. So uh, one of the things, it, and, and Socrates never gets to the point where he then offers what the solution is, he never then says, ah, well, let me tell you what virtue is. This is what you're wrong about. He doesn't do that. He just keeps asking questions. And I want to say to some degree or another, that's what I'm doing in this class, is just keep asking you questions. You know, why do we do this? Why do we, why do we not torture people? Why do we care about intentions? Why do we care what Socrates said? Why does any of this stuff matter? This is all about questions. Um, and again, I'm going to say questions are one of the keys to life, um, to understanding how important questions are. Questions of yourself, questions of other people. Um, more important than the answers, I think, most of the time, are the questions, right? Uh, the, answers, the answers are always in doubt, right? Uh, some person could say the, the answer is this, and some people could say the answer is that. But most usually the question is not in doubt, right? Um, okay, so... Uh, Another thing, obviously, that he talks about is knowing that he knows nothing and that being an evidence of his wisdom. Um, I forget what it's called, but I just want to point out the effect that we know of. Again, I forget what it's called. The idea that people who know a lot about something see it as very complicated and people who don't know much about it are very confident in their ability to simplify. So, for instance, if you ask an economist, um, well, what's going on with our economy? Well, they're likely to say, well, this is complicated. Hmm. Well, you've got this happening and you've got this happening and I'm not really sure because we have all these factors at work and who knows what will happen in the future because that economist knows all of the stuff about um, the economy has to bring all this data in um, when they're making their uh, uh, pronouncements, etc. And thus when they're bringing that, it makes them all, uh, 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 the more you know, the more you realize, holy crap, this stuff is hard to figure out. Meanwhile, you ask somebody who doesn't know anything about the economy what's going on, and they'll say, we need to, to buy more American products. That's it. We've settled the economy there. Um, you get what I'm saying? So there's this, uh, uh, there's this uh, uh, what do they call it? If you're ignorant of something, you are more likely to be confident in your answers about it. If you know something about something, you are more likely to be unconfident, right? So, oh, again, so for myself, right? So I'm a poet and somebody says to me, hey, Pete, um, what's a poem? 
And I mean, you would think that that might be easy to answer as a poet and as a, somebody who teaches poetry, but it's not easy to answer. What is a poem? Um, I think I could come up with some, some good definitions, but I think other people could come up with good definitions of what a poem is. Um, and the reason why it's hard for me to come up with a good definition is because I know a lot about poetry and it covers so many different things from all the way back to the Odyssey, um, to, to modern poetry, etc. It's a huge subject. And to say exactly what it is, is hard to do. Meanwhile, if you ask somebody who knows nothing about poetry, what's poetry? They go, well, it rhymes. They've got it figured out. They know what poetry is. You say, hey, what's poetry? They're like, oh, it rhymes. It's that thing. Um, and of course, they don't know anything about it. But they're confident that they know about it. Um, so this is a, one of the great ironies in this world. The more you learn about something, the more you realize that you don't have all the answers. The less you know about something, the more likely you are to think you have all the answers. Um, another thing... Um, Well, uh, uh, the video's already getting long, people. There's just so much. I guess I want to spend um, the last few minutes here talking about uh, a number of uh, related ideas. Um, one is the idea that he is listening to an inner, that he has an inner voice that tells him what's right and wrong, and he has to follow that inner voice. For instance, that inner voice told him not to be in politics, and because of that, he has never been in politics. Um, he has to do what his what what he believes his inner voice is telling him and and he believes that that inner voice is like a god um and i think a lot of people think that that like your conscience that what you the thing inside of you that makes you question your actions etc that that is god or that is some sort of spiritual idea um working through you that might be the case um and again i don't know um, I certainly know there are a lot of crazy people who think God is talking to them. I know that if somebody came to me and they said, I have to do such and such because there's a voice in my head that tells me I have to do such and such. Um, I don't know if I'm like, oh, that's God. I might feel like, well, you might need to see someone. Um, okay, so... Uh, that idea, the inner voice inside your head, what is that? Is that your conscience? What if you have no, what if you're a psychopath and you're con you don't have a conscience? Does that mean you don't have a God? Um, I'm not sure. Um, Socrates also talks about uh, roughly death before dishonor, which is he is not going to change his beliefs. He is not going to compromise anything about himself out of fear of death. He is, he is going to die before he dishonors himself. Um, this is very common, right? You see this on tattoos, death before dishonor. I'm just pointing out for myself, and y'all can think about it on your own. But for me, it's dishonor before death, right? If someone's standing uh, above me, and they've got a gun to my head, and they say, Hey, Pete, do you love your children? And if you love your children, I'm going to kill you. Um, I would be like, No, I do not love my children. I don't love them. And I would do that just to get out of that situation because what is that honor compared to dying? Well, to me, that's not even close. But a lot of people think, hey, no, death before dishonor. Um, so something to think about. Um, the other thing uh, is, uh, for one thing, um, he is, uh, Socrates is accused of atheism. Um, he proves roughly that that's not true. Uh, but I just want to point out that atheism is a, uh, a thing that uh, even in the past might get you killed for being an atheist. And even now, people have very mixed feelings about atheism. I want to say that uh, in general, people feel about atheists the way they feel about rapists and um, murderers, etc. If you just look at the, the percentages of what people feel feel about atheists. People tend to think that atheists have no morals, that they can't be happy, that there are all sorts of problems, inherent problems with atheism that, again, in the past might have got you killed. That's how important it is that you believe in something um, to them and maybe to many of us now. Um, and so then the other connection there is the atheism is I just want to point out um, um, after this, we're going to be reading some from the New Testament. 
And obviously most of us are familiar with the story of Jesus. I just want to point out how many similarities there are between the story of Jesus and the apology of Socrates. Um, just, just to point it out, okay? I don't know what it's supposed to mean, but um, I just want to want you to notice, right? Okay, so like Jesus, um, Socrates' words are not written down by himself, but are recorded by other people. So thus, we have to trust other people. In this case, we have to trust Plato. In the Bible's case, we have to trust whoever the authors were of those books. Um, both of them are killed unjustly. Neither one of them deserve death. Both of them get death. And along with that, both of them choose to die. They choose to not defend themselves. Um, of course, obviously, this is one of Jesus's big teachings is don't defend yourself. Uh, he does not defend himself. Um, and, and, you, uh, 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 and, and neither does Socrates, right? Um, so we can argue about this later about whether, whether Jesus really uh, uh, means don't defend yourself. But I'm going to say he really means don't defend yourself. And, and he shows that by example when he does not defend himself, just like Socrates. So both of them sort of martyr themselves for a cause. Um, they are, are willing to die for their cause. Not only are they willing to die, they kind of want to die. They want to prove a point. Um, both of them claim to have divine blessing, that God had told them what to do, um, that they had a mission that they had to fulfill. Um, they both taught the idea that you were only supposed to care about your soul and the truth. You're not supposed to care about worldly things. You're not supposed to care about respect or money or these things. You're supposed to care about the truth and following your soul and doing what is right. And that is the only thing that matters. Um, both of them have disciples and followers who, of course, um, um, do the uh, recording um, of, of what the person has to say, though not exactly in the case of the Bible, because we, we'll get into that more later, right? But they both have sort of disciples. Um, both of them, um, uh, uh, their legend grows in death. Um, both of them, both of them sort of have to die to be known, right? Um, uh, both of them work outside the system. Um, so like Jesus, right? I mean, he could have become a politician and sort of worked within the system to do something, but no, just like Socrates, he chooses to be outside the system. Um, no fear of death, um, uh, uh, claims to help everyone, right? To be here to help everyone. This is what Socrates says. Um, to show people that they're not as wise as they think they are. They think they know, but they don't. Um, and this is one of the major teachings of Jesus, right? Is that I am teaching you something that you did not know. Um, and this is what Socrates is doing too. So um, when we talk about the New Testament, right, um, think about that and the ways that that uh, uh, applies to some of the stuff uh, in the Apology of Socrates. Um, and I'm sorry this video was so long, people, but it's hard to squeeze all the stuff in and there's still plenty, plenty more to talk about if we wanted to, but we're not going to do it because I don't want to make you watch videos all day. Um, I'll be coming back with a, a video on uh, the New Testament here uh, shortly, um, and I hope everybody's doing all right. Everyone's staying safe, and I will talk to you soon. Let me know what you think about all this stuff in the comments. All right. Bye-bye.